So thank you very much uh, for the uh, kind introduction and for the invitation to Sao Paulo. I, I very much like to be here. It's my first time in this city. Uh, I've been to Brazil a few times before and I always liked and loved this country really. And I found out yesterday that Sao Paulo is very, actually it's very interest, I interesting and very fascinating. And fascinating I also find this organization, CESC, I, I, which uh, I think is a very unusual way of uh, organizing communal life and uh, also public debates and maybe politics. So I'm, uh, I'm very happy to be here. And I'm sorry that I don't speak Portuguese. <laughs> I, I, I can't do this, so I, uh, I try, try to be slow. Uh, that, uh, that hopefully you can uh, follow me and maybe also get the translation. I, I've been working on the topic of of, of, of speed, right? With the with the idea that modern modernization is about speeding up life to a great extent. I mean, when you, uh, uh, I think in, in cultural observations, when we look at when, uh, in, in cultural cultural perception, modernity has always been connected to a sense of life speeding up, of actually speeding up even the world in a literal sense. When the, in, if you think at transport more and more people are in movement simultaneously right when they started with the uh, with the with the railways and then with the cars and now with the airplanes and it's not just the people it's also goods and raw materials and now it's also data and information so modernization really is about speeding up the world and uh, we are not just it's not just something that happens to us right people really uh, uh, also it, it uh, they con or we connect our sense of happiness and of freedom to the freedom to move and to speed up things. But there is a complementary danger, right? That people feel that life might get too fast and our world might get too fast. And then we suffer the fate of this little frog here, <laughs> which, uh, which uh, it was an, it's from an advert which said, not fast enough, right? <laughs> he couldn't move fast enough, so it was run down by a world that is a kind of runaway world, as the sociologist Anthony Giddens once uh, claimed it, or Paul Virilio, the French writer, says the world seems to come down on us like an accident, right? Kind of, uh, uh, well, getting too fast uh, to us. So what I want to present to you is first, I want to present to, uh, to you a kind of new definition of what it means to live in a modern age and a modern society. And modern for me is quite long term. I think it's a systematic change in the way we organize our society and we lead our lives, which means we need to speed up in order to have something like institutional stability. So I want to present you this conception and then point out uh, why this leads to social acceleration. So in a way, uh, relating to the topic of this conference, the future we, n we weave, the future we make, we knit, right, is a future that incessantly, permanently needs to speed up, to grow and to innovate just in order to stay where we are. So social acceleration is the, uh, uh, is the, is the, the, co the concept, the principle which, uh, on which we run to stabilize ourselves. But then my diagnosis is that this actually needs to uh, leads to serious problems, to problems of synchronization, because we cannot speed up the world, the whole world, to the same extent. There are social groups who cannot be, uh, who cannot accelerate or, or refuse to accelerate. So there is a desynchronization between social groups, between the jet set, highly mobile society, and those who kind of stay. Um, tied to a place, for example, but there's also de desynchronization between the social organization, technological speed, economic transaction, and the environment. So the ecological crisis is a crisis of desynchronization. There is a desynchronization between the speed of politics, of, of doing what we talked about this morning, right? Of coming together and, uh, and democratically organizing our world. That's a time-consuming process. And uh, that might be too slow for our world. And maybe even what was once called our souls, <laughs> right, our psyche, might not be fast enough for the high, spe high speed of digital uh, society. So, and then in the end, I, I want to talk about the future we might dream of or we might, we might want to create together. And maybe this conference is a part of this. So I have to speed up because I only have 30 to 40 minutes. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> 
All right. So, so the, here's my suggestion. I mean, you know, in uh, in the social sciences and in philosophy and in the humanities, there is a huge debate about what modernity is about. I once wanted to publish a book in in Portuguese in Brazil, actually, <coughs> and uh, then there were reviews and, uh, uh, w and and they declined it. It's not interesting for Brazil because you don't talk about modernity anymore. <laughs> That's what they said, right? I found that very interesting. <laughs> and I also understand it to some extent, right? There's a huge debate in, uh, uh, in the social sciences about whether modernity is still a useful concept because, of course, as you might know, Schmuel Eisenstadt and others talk about multiple modernities, right? Modernity in Brazil might be different from the European or from the North American or from the Chinese or the Japanese or the South African or the African modernities. And maybe even within Brazil there are different modernities. And I think certainly we have to have a clear sense of differences, right? But nevertheless, multiplicity is not enough. Is there something, right? That is a kind of that that is a kind of a, a, a determining principle in the a kind of global logic. What you can what what you could call globalization in the way we reorganize social life, digital life in the 21st century. And so here, I, I want to keep the term modernity. I think we have to or um, the modern. And I, I, I here is my suggestion how we could define it because it's kind of it's neutral with respect to value or culture. I'm not saying the modern is the good and the non-modern is a bad thing. So here's my definition: a society can be called modern when its mode of stabilization and structural or institutional reproduction is dynamic. This means a society is modern when it needs growth, acceleration, and innovation just to keep its institutional status quo or structure and uh, to maintain the status quo and to keep its form. So what do I mean by this? I mean it's very easy to see. I, I think it's a change in the way we organize our life which uh, occurs from the 18th century onwards, certainly also in, uh, in uh, Latin America and in Europe and in North America first, but then also elsewhere uh, very quickly. You see it in a capitalist economy most easily. Right, uh, you, you know this is the the, the basic the, the raw formula of capitalism. Money is only invested into commodity when there is the promise and the prospect of making more money out of it. Right, no one. Yeah, I mean that's quite. It's 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 nothing. It's nothing um, in, in immoral or injustice or bad about it. That's the logic of capitalist economy. You invest capital in order to create more capital, right? Money, commodity, more money. And if a, a, an economy, you can actually, it, it's actually true for the individual companies as well as for the national economy. If Brazil doesn't achieve growth, you are really in trouble. And it's the same for Germany, the EU, for North America, for everyone, right? Uh, modern national economies need to increase their gross domestic products, right? In order to keep their institutional structure if the Brazilian economy does not grow, I mean, you had some trouble like everyone else, right, after 2008. Uh, so it, without growth, the institutional structure is in trouble, right? Jobs might get lost, companies close down, then the, uh, the tax revenue goes down, but public expenditure goes up because you need to invest into uh, getting the economy going again and also in welfare programs and other things. And that creates a budget problem. We, we can observe that all over the world. And even the de delegitimization of, uh, of the political system. Greece, for example, in Europe is an interesting example for this, but you had similar problems in Argentina, for example. But when you look at Greece, it did not grow for, uh, for 10 years or so, it actually declined. But then immediately, immediately you have serious problems for the whole institutional structures, high rates of unemployment, a breakdown of the welfare system, a kind of serious political democratic crisis, a huge budget crisis, and there's almost no solution to this problem. You cannot, I mean, unless there's a, there is a, a, a debt cut, will pr which probably will happen soon. So on a worldwide scale at least, some n in some nations and some regions you might not have growth for some time, but that leads to institutional destability. And the logic of increase is still in place there, right? So a capitalist economy works on, on the condition that it permanently grows and growth is connected to acceleration and innovation, right? How do you achieve growth in order to come up with new 
pro products or processes of productions, right? So innovation and acceleration is necessary for this process, right? In a capitalist economy, time is money, as you know, uh, for in many um, uh, respects. So uh, saving, so so as money is always scarce, time is always scarce, and um, uh, and you invest time similarly as you invest money. And by the way, I find this very interesting. You know, Be Benjamin Franklin. Max Weber quotes Benjamin Franklin, who said. Always remember that time is money, right? So don't waste time because that means wasting money. And in an economy which runs on this uh, uh, scale, that's a problem. But I think I would almost uh, go with uh, Pierre Bourdieu, the French sociologist in that sense. We, we you and I, right? And, and we, we do not always remember that time is money. So when you go home today, in the evening, you work long, you don't care about money, f maybe, right, for, uh, for, uh, for the rest of the day. But then you remember that money is also cultural capital, right? You should read some books which you always needed to read or, or write something which you always wanted to write or maybe see a play or so because you have to kind of to recreate your cultural capital, your knowledge uh, uh, of the world. At least you have to see the news. But maybe in the evening you say, oh, no, today I don't want to remember that time is money and that time is cultural capital, so forget about it. But then you also you still remember time is social capital. Right? There are many people you wanted to call or to answer their emails or their WhatsApps, or even you wanted to, uh, to, to care for your relatives or for your friends, which you have not seen for a long time. So when you sit at home, you feel somehow pressed. Oh, time is money. Okay, no, not today. Oh, time is culture, cultural capital. Oh, maybe not today. But then it's still social capital. And if you really are very strong and you don't care tonight <laughs> that time is money, time is cultural capital, time is social capital, you remember that time is also physical capital. It's body capital. So you should do something for your body, right? Go a little for jogging or to the gym or, <laughs> or at least do some uh, meditation, right? Some uh, mind-based stress reduction or so, your, some yoga or something like this. Right? So the logic of increase, increasing your capital foundation in order to, ma to give you the, the, the resources you need to stay in your position, right? To not fall behind the others who all invest in their cultural, social and so on. Uh, a capital. So this logic is uh, is very powerful. I think it's much more powerful t than at the age where Marx and Max Weber wrote about it. But f for me, it's quite interesting to see that it's not that this logic, dynamic stabilization, you all you only get institutional stability through permanent, uh, um, uh, uh, in a dynamic and growing way. It's also true, for example, in politics. Because, of course, how do we stabilize, how do we recreate political um, uh, p uh, 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 power, of our governmental power? There, it's not just that there is a king or an emperor right, who is there all the time, like, like Edward I, Edward II, Edward III. It's always the same system. But political power has to be kind of dynamically stabilized with elections every four years. And you only win the election if you promise some sort of increase. Right, so I think in 2018 the next president will be elected, right? And uh, electoral competition will be led <coughs> about promises of increase. So one candidate will promise, vote for me, and you will get more jobs, more wealth, more streets, maybe more industry, and so on. And the other candidate will maybe promise more hospital beds, more uh, university places, or so or whatever. But it's dynamic stabilization there too. And what I find very interesting culturally is that it's that in in, in s did I forget science here? No, here. This I find very interesting because this is my own formula, right? In a in, our, in, in, in the way we deal with science, it's the same logic as you have here. It's knowledge, research, more knowledge, right? And that's very unusual culturally. I mean, when you look at, at non-modern forms of culture, right? It might be pre-modern or just extra, this, this logic of, uh, of, of modernity. Knowledge is always treated like a treasure, right? You have to know how to do things. For example, how to hunt game, right, or deers or also a stag, or how to uh, grow crops. 
and so on. Or you and you have to know how to build a home and how to um, a, a fabric clothes and so on, and how to do the rituals, the services in a temple or so. But it's kind of a knowledge which is a treasure. Very often, uh, most cultures think that this knowledge has come down from the ancestors, right, through a long chain of history, or it was even revealed in sacred sources, and you have to hand it down in a kind of scholarly um, um, institution. Th so the school with the master and the disciple, very often it's male-dominated, right, is the main form uh, uh, in a patriarchal society of how people deal with knowledge. And knowledge is the highest form of, it's, it's a treasure of a different sort. It's not like money, it's different. But in modernity, science has become the center of knowledge. In, in German, it's very nice in the word because it's, so to speak, moving from Wissen to Wissenschaft, because Wissen is a kind of a treasure, like, like money in the old age, right? But Wissenschaft, in the second part of the word, Schaft, you see production, permanent production of new knowledge. So how is science done today? If you're a scientist, you have to promise, for example, I mean, it's now, I think it's the same in Brazil, like everywhere. You have to promise that you will create new knowledge, something that was not there before through certain money, right? So I have to prove, I'm a learned scholar, give me two million uh, euros or so, and I will produce new knowledge. Right? It's actually, that's how the whole scientific system is done here. You promise that with, within a given period of time, with a certain economic uh, basis, right, you will create new knowledge, more knowledge. So knowledge is permanently about looking further into the universe looking deeper into matter, right? Or looking deeper into our organs or so on. So it's permanently pushing the boundaries. That's what we do with science. So, and it's the same, by the way, in art. We no longer have the conception of that art is recreating either nature or in, in, in one form or the other. Natura natura and so natura naturata. But, but going beyond what others have done before. So I believe this, the logic that you can only recreate the institutional status quo through increase, through going beyond, through acceleration and um, innovation and growth is, a, a, is basic for our society. And by the way, I think it's also, it, it has, it is, it's not just outside the institutional structure and we are the poor victims because what it means, I mean, what I want to say, to tell you, and I think this is really important, is the fact that no matter how fast you live this year. Next year you have to run a little faster or you will lose out <laughs> in the competition, right? It's true individually and collectively. If Brazil slows down, right, you will lose out in the international global competition. But it's also true for you as individuals because very often people, are, I'm sure in a megalopolis like Sao Paulo, it's the same like anywhere else. People say, oh, my life is so fast, it's quite okay, I'm doing fine, right? I have a good job maybe and a nice family and so on. But I'm so, I'm so stressed at the moment. Then I really have bad news for you. Forget this at the moment. Next year it will be worse, right? And, and the problem is it's not worse because we are going to some interesting place. It's, it's, it's going to be worse just to stay where you are. If you slow down, you will lose out, so that's a problem. But nevertheless, there is also... Nevertheless, this logic of speeding up, going beyond, increase, is in our soul, so to speak. It's in our brain, uh, uh, through the logic of what I call the triple A approach to the good life. What is a good life for you? P probably you cannot spell out a whole, uh, uh, a whole program. It's very hard to tell in a in, in, in modern society. But, it's, but what, you, what, what we are led by is the idea that it would be good to, to make more parts of the world, and the world is a kind of t a to a totality, a cultural totality of the possibilities that there are in the world. You want to make them available, attainable, and accessible. Look, this is why for us, as subjects, money is interesting. Why, why are you interested in money? Right? Mo most of us are, right? Even scientists, even so we claim, <laughs> no, 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 we are not led by science. Uh, but it's not totally true. Mm -hmm. So why is money attractive for modern subjects because it's the it's a kind of the magic charm so to speak with which you make the world available if you win a million uh, no 10 million reais <laughs> right tonight <laughs> you, you, more of the world is available accessible and attainable to you it's more easy for you to fly to all places you can buy a house in new york maybe or wherever you want to 
or a yacht and sail the oceans or even an airplane, right? So money makes you the world available, attainable, accessible. And it's not just money. It's a actually, it's the same with the other things. Why do you want to live in Sao Paulo rather than in the Amazonas region, which is very nice, I believe. I've never been there. <laughs> but, why <laughs> <laughs> but why do most people want to live in Sao Paulo? Well, you will say, well, because in Sao Paulo I have the MASP, which is spectacular. I was there yesterday. <laughs> the, uh, the museums and the shopping centers and the stadiums and the teatros and, the, and the, uh, all everything that SESC gives to you and so on. You have the world... Available, attainable, accessible, right? And if you live at the Amazonas, it's not there, you're right? So, so I call this, in German, I call this Weltreichweite. The scope and the reach of what you can make accessible, available, attainable is uh, big in, in Sao Paulo, but small in the Amazonas. It's big if you have a lot of money, but small if you have little money. So, so our implicit conception of the good life, what you live by, is the idea, I want to have the world disposable, so to speak, available, accessible, attainable. Now I'm running out of time. <laughs> <laughs> but what I want to say so far is that there is a kind of the, what, what, uh, what, um, uh, what Max Weber called the iron cage of modernity, right? It's the necessity to permanently grow, to innovate and to accelerate just to stay as we are. Now, actually, I want to skip the second part because the, 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 the idea is very easy. Let me put you to this. The idea is very easy. I spoiled my, I spoiled my, <laughs> my nice uh, <laughs> uh, play. Uh, now the logic, um, the logic is that, or the problem is that with this logic of permanent increase, the problem of time will become worse and worse because you cannot increase time, right? We, we cannot augment time. You will always only have 24 hours per day, so we have many more goods which we use uh, at any one time. Like what I say here, for example, the average. Household now contains about 10,000 objects, the middle class household, in, I, I believe in Sao Paulo, it's similar to Europe. In, in 1900, it was only 400 objects, right? So the number of objects you produce, you consume, you distribute has vastly increased. It's escalatory logic. And the number of people you are in contact with through Facebook and WhatsApp and, uh, and all these things, right? But also you, you read about in the papers, you see them on TV, you listen to them on the radio. It has kind of increased in an escalatory pace. Kenneth Gergen, an American psychologist, says the number of people you meet on one day is more than the number of people that a medieval person met in the whole of his life. Uh, if, if, if you also count those you read about and so on. And of course, you have many, many options of things you want to do and things other people expect you to do. So there is an explosion in everything, but only 24 hours per day. Right? This is the reason why, time, why we are running out of time. Right? Time is probably the scarcest resource of the future. It's much worse than oil. Right? Now people say probably will there will be enough oil. The, the, the talk of peak oil is kind of out. There is now a kind of peak demand. Very soon, the demand in oil might drop, right? Which is actually maybe not so good for Brazil. But uh, but but so but you so we can increase everything, but you cannot increase time. So we are running out of time, and that means that there is a permanent acceleration in the technology, transport, communication, and production of goods and services. And also, the world changes at a phase to pass. The world does not stay the same in the future we create in this way, right? And therefore, you have to run faster and faster just to stay in place. You try to do everything faster by running faster, by not having any breaks or pauses, and by multitasking. So while you sit here, you might kind of occasionally look at your smartphones which uh, yeah. so you can keep in touch with everything else that's going on around you. Now, why is this a problem? First of all, first of all we need more and more energy to keep this logic of acceleration going. We need uh, uh, raw materials, resources like oil and other stuff, but we also need political energy. Politics in this age is all about kind of, 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 of creating more dynamics, right? Making the flows of capital coming to your country or your region and so on. So politics is about uh, uh, kind of educating the young to a higher degree and faster in order for them to be creative, using even the old age people, using natural resources and so on. So we need political energy, uh, uh, physical energy, but also psychological energy. 
this logic of speed up, right? It's not going on by, by itself. It's us, the human beings. It's our psychological fabric, right? Which, which, uh, which keeps this logic of increase and growth and so on going. So we need more and more energy to keep it going. And, and the frustrating thing, I think this is really, this is new in the 21st century. And I'm not so sure this is something we would debate. I think maybe for Brazil it might be different. B but I think in Europe, you know, that's the, that's the familiar story of Europe getting tired. At least in the 18th century, the idea was that growth and acceleration and innovation will bring about a better life. We are running forward. It's the logic of progress. We are progressing towards the golden age, the Neuzeit, the, the, the new age. It's something we create by becoming wealthy, we will overcome poverty and scarcity. By, uh, by inventing technologically, we will make life better, and so to speak. And by speeding up technologically, we will overcome the scarcity of time. But now, in the 21st century, we have lost that hope. Right? We do not believe that we will overcome scarcity. It's rather, it's the, others, uh, the opposite way, right? In Brazil, as in Europe, p politicians and economists tell you, if you don't run really fast, you will fall behind, right? Things will get much worse. Global competition will be much harder in the future. So there's no longer the promise of the great world you're running to. It's the opposite. If you don't run, you will fall down the drain, go into the abyss, right? And, uh, uh, and, 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 and no one believes that we will overcome the scarcity of time through uh, faster technologies, for example. And we will not even, o we will not even overcome uh, ignorance. So, so in the middle classes, for the first time in the last tw 250 years, middle class parents no longer believe that they work hard and do what they can in order for their kids to have a better life. Right? All over the place, in Japan, for example, in the US, in Europe, and I think also in the big cities in Brazil at least, P parents are concerned that if they don't do everything they can, if they don't work as hard as possible, if they don't train their kids as hard as possible, they will go down, they will have a worse life, right? So, th so now we have to run not in order to run forward, to reach the golden horizon, to realize a promise. We have to run faster and faster, not to make it bad, not to fall into c disaster and the catastrophe. <laughs> and this is what I don't know about Brazil, I think, because there might be many places in perhaps, right, I'm speculating, where, where Brazilians still would want to speed up and move forward and grow. And I have something to say about this in the end. I still have time? Yes. Great. <laughs> okay. Uh, so this is not so important, but here become my, de my desynchronizations, right? So, 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 the, so, what I want so what I've said so far is we permanently speed up, we dynamize the world, growth, innovation, speeding up. Now, not everything can speed up to the same degree. I mean, there are some forms of life which might disappear if you permanently push them to speed up, right? Uh, in, in, uh, in indigenous forms of life, p for example, they are permanently in danger of being eroded by this pressure to speed up, uh, for example. But it might also be a kind of class difference, right? This is something Sigmund Bauman and others have argued, I think, quite forcefully, that those who are flexible and fast, they win out in this game. And those who are settled down and slow might lose out. But nevertheless, there are four kind of very hard systemic limits. One is the ecological limit. I believe that the system of economic production right, and, 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 and uh, technological change is too fast for the environment. Right? So it's not a problem if people cut down trees. Beavers, for example, did cut down trees for millions of years. But it's a problem if you cut it down in the Amazonian rainforest at the rate which is too fast for the for the for the for the trees to reproduce and it's the same with the oceans that we fish is not bad right uh, 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 mammals have done that for millions of years <coughs> but if we fish the oceans at a speed which is so high that the fish cannot reproduce uh, they will be gone very quickly right so we are too fast for some of the nature's proper times, and it's the same with pollution. I think actually, glo actually global warming, global warming is very interesting. 
because because the the physical energy we need to to dynamize the world literally right as we speak here together there are about two million people in the air right now above the world two million people at the same time right uh, and of course that needs a lot of this dynamization needs a lot of energy and this kind of energy uh, is transformed into speeding up the atmosphere right because heating up the gas or the atmosphere around Earth is making the molecules spin faster. It's speeding up in a literal sense. So there's ecological desynchronization between nature's time, temporality, and the human time uh, uh, down here on Earth. And then, as I already said, I think it's we have to rethink democracy. We certainly have, right? Because the, the democracy as we knew it is in trouble all over the world, I, I, I would say, right? Pro probably in Brazil, certainly in the US, certainly in in uh, Europe and everywhere else. And why is this? Because democracy is a time-consuming process, right? It's not just about having a vote, saying yes or no. Democracy is the idea of, it has a lot to do with what we heard uh, this morning, people coming together and deliberating together, formulating possibilities and ideas, right? And then setting in motion a kind of dialogue or, or a, a, a multi-logue, right? Where, where we actually, I have now just written a new book, it's titled, it's Resonance. And I believe that democracy is a kind of resonant um, um, a process where it's not about, I have to have my will or you have to have your will. It's about, I, I, I make my voice heard and all of you make your voices heard too. And then we have to listen and to answer. And in this process of listening and answering, we transform. I change my view after the dialogue. You change your view after the dialogue. So this is how we construct a future which is much more promising, but you cannot tell in advance what the result of democratic deliberation and negotiation will be. It's always a kind of open process. And this openness is time-consuming and it's against the logic of forced increase, speed-up and dynamization. Though yeah. There is desynchronization between the temporality of democracy and the temporality of the markets or of dynamic stabilization. Then I believe even within the economy, we have a desynchronization between the speed of the financial markets, because the finance capital, right, and currencies can be traded within fractions of seconds. It's done by computer algorithms. But the real economy is time consuming. It takes time to build a house or to build a car or even to write a book. And what's worse, it takes a lot of time to consume these things. You did not consume a book when you buy it. <laughs> you consume it when you read it. And this really takes a lot of time, right? So there is a desynchronization between the speed of the financial markets and the speed of uh, the real, so the so-called real economy. And finally, and this is where what I find very interesting, I, I believe if we want to have a democratic future, if we want to think about the future we want to create, we need to somehow rethink about what a good life is, right? What is good for us as human beings? Not how can we make Brazil faster and more competitive, right? But how can we create a, a world in which we want to live, which is good for us as human beings? And there are quite a, lo a, a, long, a, a, a lot of numbers uh, of reasons why for us as human beings th this logic is very depressing, right? That we have to run faster and faster just to stay where we are might not lead to a good life, right? It might actually create burnout. A burnout is a state of affairs in which you have lost all access of resonance. You might have a job, you're very successful, you might have a family, you might have a, um, a, a many uh, kind of civic engagements, connections, a lot of social, cultural, physical capital, but you might feel totally, d you might actually fall into burnout. And what is burnout? It's a state of affairs where the world doesn't answer where you don't feel connected, right? It's a, I call it alienation in the sense that the, it's, a, it's a relationship without relations, as Rahel Yegi terms it, right? So, so burnout might be the consequence of a high-speed society in which you don't have enough time to really appropriate the world, to get into a mode of resonant answering and listening. So this logic of speed up, of dynamic stabilization creates, creates a lot of problems in the long run. So now I'm, uh, I'm almost done. The question is, what do we do? Because this is also about the future. How do we imagine a better future? And I think it's necessary to break out of the logic of dynamic stabilization. We need a different form of stabilization. I now call it adaptive 
stabilization. So what does that mean? Because of course we cannot just be static, right? It wouldn't be a good idea to freeze society, right? So actually no society was successful by just being static. Societies always change and they transform and they morph into something new. But so my claim is we have to make that a kind of adaptive stabilization. That means when there is a new challenge or a new problem, you have to be, sometimes you, ha you, ha you ha certainly have to be innovative, sometimes you have to speed up, and sometimes you have to grow. Right? Societies always did. But I mean, what, what I'm looking for is not a society Look, it's not a society that does, n that does never uh, 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 speed up or innovate or grow. So we should be able to do this, but we only should be able to do, or we only should do this when we want a, st a change of the status quo. For example, there might be some regions in Brazil, maybe, or, or in some other places where there is not enough food. There, of course, we need growth. But this is growth in order to change the status quo, to overcome scarcity. And of course, you might want speed up in internet connections in some Amazonas region or so, right? That's, that's speed up, that's acceleration, but it's acceleration in order to change the status quo. And certainly, you want innovation in green technologies or in some, I don't know, some, some uh, new medicine or so. But it's, but, uh, so, so I think the society we want to have should be a society that is capable of speeding up, of producing growth, and of innovating in order to, to, if there is some need for it, some political or cultural or, or ecological or, or, or medical need for it, or a desire at least. So speed, innovation, growth should be possible in order to change the status quo. But it shouldn't be a kind of uh, a state of existence where at the beginning of the year you have to say, oh, we have enough, like in Germany or so, right? We have enough cars, we have enough clothes, we have enough food, we have enough computers, but somehow we have to achieve growth, right? So that's, that's I think, the idiotic thing, right? If you have to say, uh, and people feel that they are running as fast as they can, but nevertheless, s this year we somehow have to speed up, we have to innovate, we have to grow just to stay who we are, right? So that's, I think, what we should break. So gr moving from... Uh, dynamic stabilization to adaptive stabilization and that means and that's why I don't like particularly the term I like a lot about the idea of degrowth which is also a topic of this conference but I don't like the term very much because not in all conditions it makes sense to shrink right <laughs> for example if, if there is a region where there is hunger it doesn't make a lot of sense to tell them that they should degrow right so I think uh, whether or not there is actual growth and speed up has nothing to do with the logic of dynamic stabilization. For example, Greece is shrinking, but it's, a, but it's a growth society in the sense that it cannot maintain its status quo without growth, acceleration, and innovation, right? So Greece is not a degrowth society. It's a growth society that, that degrows. And th certainly there could be places in, a, I don't know, in some poor region, where we will have growth, acceleration, and innovation, which would not be a, a, a growth society in the sense of dynamic stabilization. So if we want to, to, how do we get there? I believe we should do it in a democratic way, which is very hard to think right now, but democracy in the sense of a sphere of resonance, right? Where people are given a voice and when they, where they make their voice heard, but it's not just the voice of protest or anger or cynical laughter, but it's the voice which is used in a way of listening and answering, that we actually hear the other, not just despise them. I think worldwide the problem with democracy is that the two sides, most often it's two sides, they don't listen and answer. They think the others are idiots. The Trumpists think all the liberals are just bad idiots, and the liberals think that the Trumpists are just fascists and racists and idiots, right? So that's the end of democracy. It's no longer a, a resonance field, but we somehow need to uh, regain democracy, and then, and uh, this is what we're working on in Jena, we have a huge consortium. I think we need economic reforms because this capital logic, money, commodity, more money, is totally growth dependent. So I believe, so we are we're working on an idea of economic democracy that does have a place for markets and for competition, right? But, uh, but, it, but, it's, but this kind of place is defined politically and culturally. Then I think we need a welfare reform. I'm, I'm pers permanent, personally, I favor a basic, uh, unconditional basic income because this would take the fear and the anxiety out of this logic of permanent increase, right? 
And what I, what I said, I think we need a new definition of what a good life is. This is, I just published a book in German. It's 800 pages. It's 800 pages. It's called Resonance, the logic of being in the world, so to speak. And I believe we have to, to move from this uh, uh, conception of the good life, where the good life is about attainability, accessibility, availability, towards a form of life which, which takes it as the, the normative yardstick. What is good is being in resonance, being in an answering mode with the people you live with, but also with nature, for example, or with art, <laughs> or with your work. People love to work when it's a resonant relationship where they feel self-efficacy, right, on the one hand, but also receptive, affected by what they're doing on the other hand. So we need a new uh, a yardstick for the good life, and this good yardstick is called resonance. Thanks a lot for your patience. Thank you.